Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the fourth of our annual series of lectures on public policy, which has been endowed at the Institute. After the lecture, there'll be a reception to which you're all invited in Ford Hall, and, the, and there will also be, at the end of the lecture, opportunity for questions. Today, our speaker is James Hansen, who is director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and an adjunct professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. He took his bachelor's degree in physics and mathematics and his master's degree in astronomy, and in 1967, his doctorate, all from the University of Iowa. He was a postdoctoral fellow in Leiden before joining Columbia University as a research associate in 1969. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1996. His work has been recognized by the award of very many prizes, including the Duke of Edinburgh Conservation Medal from the World Wildlife Fund in 2006, the Commonwealth Award for Distinguished Service in Science in 2008, and the Carl Gustav Rossby Research Medal from the American Meteorological Society in 2009. Today, James Hansen's title is Human-Made Climate Change, a Moral, Political, and Legal Issue. Thank, thanks very much. And uh, as I indicate on the bottom of my slide, um, although I'm a government employee, I'm speaking as a private citizen. Um, not representing the government in my uh, discussion related to policy. The, um, the situation with regard to global climate change, and global warming in particular, continues to be that there is a big gap between what is understood by the relevant scientific community and what is known by the people who need to know, and that's the public and policymakers. The, it's uh, <clears throat> difficult for people to recognize, but the fact is that we have reached a point where we have an emergency, where we, we have a crisis. And it's not obvious because the degree of global warming is small in comparison to weather fluctuations from day to day. But the reason that that can be is because, uh, in large part, because of the inertia of the climate system. The ocean is four kilometers deep. Ice sheets are two or three kilometers thick. They don't respond quickly as we begin to apply a forcing to them. But they do respond, and th the result is that because the system has only partly responded to the forcings that humans are applying, there's still more change that is in the pipeline, even if we don't change atmospheric composition any further. And the danger is that the system can pass tipping points where the dynamics of the system begins to take over, and you continue to get change which is uh, out of your control. The, the bad news is that in just the last few years, it's become clear that the dangerous level is uh, less than what we thought several years ago. In fact, carbon dioxide has already risen into a, a, into a dangerous zone. If we want to keep a planet that looks like the one that has existed the last uh, 10 to 12,000 years during the Holocene, uh, the period when civilization developed, we're going to have to reduce CO2 to less than 350 parts per million. And that's still possible, and there would be multiple benefits of doing that, but it's not a path uh, that we're on. Just a few words about uh, the tipping points. One of them is um, the possibility of ice sheet disintegration. The principal process there is the ocean warming because as the ocean uh, gets warmer, it melts the ice shelves, which are the tongues of ice 
that um, reach out from the ice sheets into the ocean. And those buttress the ice sheet, uh, the, the main ice sheet behind them. And so as they disappear, the um, ice sheets can discharge uh, ice to the ocean much more rapidly and can begin to disintegrate. And we know that when ice sheets disintegrate, they can, uh, they can disintegrate quite rapidly. There are, in prior global warmings, uh, the last time an ice sheet disintegrated was the Laurentide ice sheet uh, over Canada. Um, and when that disintegrated uh, about 14,000 years ago, there was a period of several centuries where the sea level went up five meters a century or one meter every 20 years. So you don't want to get to a point where ice sheets begin to rapidly disintegrate. Another uh, nonlinear problem is uh, species extermination because uh, we're putting pressure on species in a number of different ways, but on the long run, the biggest effect will be the shifting of climate zones. As the planet gets warmer, a, a given temperature line is now moving poleward at a rate of about 50 to 60 kilometers per decade. And that's been true for the last uh, three decades. As that shift becomes large enough, it forces species either to migrate or to, uh, or to go extinct. And some of them can migrate pretty easily, but others can't migrate that fast. And as some species go extinct, because of the interdependencies uh, among them, you can, you can cause ecosystems to collapse and you get a large number of extinctions. And again, from the history of the Earth, we know that that's not speculation. There have, during prior global warmings of five or six degrees Celsius, uh, a large fraction on, of the species on the planet were driven to extinction and then over hundreds of thousands of years and millions of years, then new species evolved. But on any time scale that we can imagine, it would be a much more desolate planet if we drive species to extinction. Um, I, in uh, the title of my talk, and uh, the, in the bottom line, that the intergenerational uh, injustice of what uh, we're, causing uh, to happen. Uh, but this is something that's only really uh, been uh, affected me substantially in just the last few years. Um, I had, although I had testified to Congress in the 1980s and that had got a lot of attention and it also caused me to realize that I didn't want to be involved in the public aspect of this problem. I, I prefer to do the science, and I'm not a uh, naturally a, a public speaker. And so I decided to get out of the public aspect um, after the last time I had testified in 1989 to Al Gore's committee. And uh, I actually maintained that, so I would refer uh, media requests to Steve Schneider, who was a good friend and who's very articulate and who likes to to talk to the media, and Michael Oppenheimer, who's also uh, very good. Um, and so at the time, uh, this, my first grandchild, Sophie, uh, is now 12 years old, but I used this photo in a scientific talk at Lamont Observatory in the year 2000 because the day before, the newspapers had called me the grandfather of global warming. And, and that, that, that actually is not true, of course. But the, the, uh, global, the greenhouse effect and global warming ha has been uh, a scientific uh, topic for a century. Um, but, uh, but at least I was a grandfather. Uh, and that was all the farther I took that until in 2004, I decided after trying enough unsuccessfully, and have, actually I had the opportunity to speak with Vice President Cheney and six cabinet members and was not able, of course, to make any headway in terms of influencing their opinions or their policies. So I decided uh, to give one public talk in which I would back it up with some scientific papers and try to make clear this gap between what was, had become clear scientifically um, 
and what was known by the public. So I used, in this case, I was using my, by then I had two grandchildren, and I was using them to try to explain the basic physics, which is very simple. As you add carbon dioxide or other infrared absorbing gases to the atmosphere, it makes the atmosphere more opaque at, in the thermal infrared region. And therefore, the emission from the planet to space will arise from a higher level in the atmosphere. And because the temperature profile falls off with height, that means the radiation to space will be arising from a colder level, and therefore it makes the planet out of energy balance. It will radiate less uh, energy to space than it would before you added those gases. And, and this is a, a very simple calculation. We can calculate very precisely what the effect is of adding the observed greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. It reduces the emission to space. If ever, you keep everything else fixed, it reduces the emission by three watts per meter squared. Um, but that's not the only thing that we're doing. There's one other important thing that humans are doing. We're also putting pollution in the atmosphere, particulate pollution. And that, those particles scatter sunlight to space, so they reduce the heating of the Earth. Unfortunately, we're not measuring that as precisely as we're measuring the greenhouse gases. So it probably is about one and a half, one to two watts per meter squared increased reflection of sunlight to space. So the net forcing is probably in between one and two watts per meter squared. And Sophie was tr holding up these one watt Christmas tree bulbs, two of them, to show Connor that it was equivalent to having two of these bulbs over every square meter of the Earth's surface. But Connor could only count one watt. And the, and the truth is we don't know very accurately. It could be, it's, it's, it's probably in the range from one to two watts. Now, we, we can confirm uh, the basic physics uh, very well because where does this energy go? Well, the heat capacity of the atmosphere is very small. The conductivity of the continents is very low, so the temperature uh, perturbation only penetrates the upper few tens of meters of the ground, and that's, that's very low heat capacity. So almost all of this energy, the excess energy coming into the planet must be going into the ocean. We're finally beginning to measure the ocean's heat content uh, well enough to quantify this uh, better than we could in the past because we now have a few thousand Argo floats distributed around the global ocean. They have instrument packages on them which yo-yo down to a depth of two kilometers and then yo-yo back up. And among the measurements that they make are the temperature of the ocean water. And what we find is that the planet indeed is out of energy balance. Um, I, I think it should be out of balance by about three quarters of a watt because, um, you know, as the planet is out of balance, well, that more energy coming in than going out, that's causing the planet to get warmer. And it has warmed up. Uh, this is the temperature over the last century, averaged over five years and averaged over 11 years so that we take out the natural variability due to the El Nino, La Nina cycle of ocean temperature, and we take out the solar cycle. And so you can see that over the last 30 years, the period in which the, most of the greenhouse gas increase occurred, that the planet has been warming. It's warmed about half as much as we would expect for the greenhouse gases added to the atmosphere. The other half of that warming is still, this shows that it's still to come because the planet is still out of energy balance, um, at least by half a watt per meter squared, and I think probably by about three quarters of a watt, but we haven't quantified it that precisely. Now, so I went back to Connor and Sophie more recently and asked them what this imbalance was, and they said they don't know. But, uh, fi but finally, and uh, I mean, it's our fault if we don't make the measurements of the aerosols to figure out what uh, 
that forcing is. But um, yeah, finally, after yeah, after my experience a few years ago, when um, during the late in the Bush administration, when um, the uh, the media, the um, public affairs offices tried to prevent us from talking about um, the global warming, I decided um, that I didn't want my grandchildren to say that Opa understood what was happening, but he didn't make it clear. So I decided, so I started working a little bit harder on giving some talks on this subject. And, um, and in fact, what I, what I really found out though, I, especially in going to other countries, you know, the problem is the governments all say the right words. They say we have a planet in peril and we need to do something about it. Um, but I found, and I thought, you know, during the Bush administration, I thought I could go over and talk to the government in the United Kingdom, for example, where Tony Blair was saying all the right words. What I found was that in each of these countries, and I find I have more access to the high levels in some of these other countries, but in even the greenest countries like Norway, which we think is very green, and they certainly say all the right things, this, it turns out, you know, they're funding, their, their government is funding the development of tar sands in Canada. Um, so, one thing that we decided to do was uh, try to have some influence on our government via um, a so-called Million Letter March, and Sophie was writing one of the first letters um, to um, President Obama, and then uh, I was reading her letter, and uh, she, actually she, she, she did this on the spot. We had wanted to take some photos of her writing a letter and hadn't really warned her uh, beforehand, but she wrote on the spot actually a very good letter where, among other things, she said, why don't you listen to my grandfather? <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty clever. And so then we were, uh, ce we were celebrating uh, her, uh, her great letter. Um, now, let's go to the science. The basis of our understanding comes especially from the Earth's history, from information on how the Earth responded in the past to changes in the boundary conditions. I, and <coughs> also from... Um, observations now, satellite observations of, of, of the globe of how the world is responding to the very rapid changes that humans are introducing. And climate models also help us, uh, especially for the sake of projecting into the future. Um, I th think I um, cannot talk very long about the paleoclimate, but it's, it's uh, I do want to say a few things because it's, it's incredibly um, rich in information uh, that helps us understand how sensitive um, the global climate is. This is a graph of the deep ocean temperature over the last uh, 65 million years, the Cenozoic era. And then uh, I've expanded the last few million years here, the last five million years, so you can see these oscillations. These are the glacial to interglacial oscillations. And then the last uh, few hundred thousand, last half million years are expanded here. We're of course living in, in the Holocene, um, which the last almost 12,000 years have been this period with very stable uh, temperature and with uh, sea level very stable. The last ice age, 20,000 years ago, there was an ice sheet that reached down about this far, covered New York and Minneapolis and Seattle, and sea level was 110 meters, 350 feet uh, lower because of this large ice sheet over Canada. Um, but basically what is going on here um, the principal mechanism involved in this very large uh, climate change. So between 65 million years ago 
and 34 million years ago, the planet was so warm uh, that there was no ice sheets on the planet. The Antarctica began to be, be glaciated when it got uh, this cold, and it, it glaciated quite rapidly. Um, the, the broad sweep of this climate change is primarily related to the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which the amount of, of carbon dioxide in the surface reservoirs, that means the atmosphere, the ocean, the um, biosphere, and, and the soil, um, uh, the amount in those surface reservoirs changes with time because uh, it, there's an exchange with the solid earth the, because the source of carbon dioxide from the solid earth, which is volcanoes, and the sink, which is the weathering process, those do not need to be in balance at any given time. It depends upon continental drift because the volcanoes uh, volcanic activity depends upon continental drift. Uh, what is happening in these, these CO2 is also involved in these glacial to interglacial oscillations, but it's involved in, as a feedback. Um, the cause of these oscillations is perturbations of the Earth's orbit, which affect the distribution of sunlight over the planet and can cause the polar ice sheets to, to melt or grow depending upon how much sunlight there is at the high latitudes. But, so for example, let's, in the, um, um, in the early, in, in these, uh, during these ice age, uh, oscillations, we have very precise measurements of how the atmospheric composition was changing because we have samples of air. As the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica built up from snowfall, they trapped bub uh, bubbles of air. So we can sample the composition of the air back for almost a million years and see very accurately how carbon dioxide and other um, atmospheric composition changed. On these longer time scales, the measurement are not as, the indirect measurements are not as accurate, but there was of the order of a thousand parts per million of CO2 during the early Cenozoic. And the, so the causes of these climate change have got to be either based on the amount of energy coming into the system or some changes within the atmosphere or some changes on the surface. Well, we know that the sun is a well-behaved main sequence star. It's burning hydrogen in its core, nuclear fusion uh, to helium, and it's slowly getting brighter over time. So 65 million years ago, it was four-tenths of 1% dimmer. Because the Earth absorbs 240 watts of energy from the sun, that means that over that period, the solar irradiance has increased by one watt per meter squared. The continents 65 million years ago were already close to their present position so the change in the surface reflectivity due to the continental locations is a forcing of less than one watt per meter squared. But CO2, we know, changed from 170 parts per million during the Ice Ages to more than 1,000 parts per million during the early Cenozoic. That's a forcing of more than 10 watts per meter squared. So that's clearly the dominant forcing on the long time scales. And in, on, but, um, um, what we, um, one other uh, piece of information we, uh, that's described in uh, a, a paper uh, that we published in 2008 called Target CO2, we, we can estimate that the amount of CO2 at this time was about 450 parts per million. There are other scientists who have estimated somewhat higher values than that, but um, the basic uh, conclusion from these long time scales is that although the imbalance between the volcanic source and the weathering sink 
is of the order of one ten thousandth of a part per million per year. That, in a million years, that's 100 ppm, which is a, a large climate forcing. But if you compare that to what humans are doing, we're increasing atmospheric CO2 at a rate of two parts per million per year. So we're 10,000 times more powerful than the natural geologic changes in uh, carbon dioxide in the surface reservoirs. Um, and the other conclusion that in order to go from an ice-free planet to one with ice sheets requires a CO2 changed only up to about 450 parts per million, or even if it's a couple of hundred ppm higher, which some scientists argue, it still means that, that we can't burn all the fossil fuels. If we burn all the fossil fuels, CO2 will be 800 or 900 parts per million, and we would be pushing the planet back toward the ice-free state. It would take time for the ice sheets to disintegrate, but you know, we can't, we can't do that without um, producing a different planet. Um, I think that um, unless I end up with a little more time than I thought, I think I won't talk about these glacial to interglacial transitions, except to say that, as I said, they're, they're caused by perturbations in the Earth's orbit. For example, um, the and, and that's due to other planets, Jupiter and Saturn mainly, tugging on the Earth's orbit, which causes the spin axis of, uh, of the Earth to wobble by plus or minus one degree. So when, it, when it's tilted a little bit more, then there's more sunlight on the poles, and that tends to melt the polar ice sheets. If the polar ice sheets melt a bit, that makes the planet warmer because it, 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 the surface underneath the ice and snow is darker so it absorbs more sunlight. That causes the planet to get a little warmer. As the ocean gets warmer, it gives up CO2, the same way that your Pepsi, Pepsi gives up CO2 if it gets warmer. And that's the feedback. So the CO2 uh, is an amplifying feedback in this case, and it causes about half of these temperature changes. But um, let me go on to global observations of what's happening now in response to the rapid changes in atmospheric composition that, um, that we are making, uh, we began to have satellite measurements of the area of Arctic sea ice in the late 1970s, and the amount fluctuates from year to year because of the weather variations from year to year, but overall it's decreasing uh, quite rapidly. And uh, we're going to, if we, continue business as usual, we will lose all of this Arctic sea ice uh, within, um, within the next few decades. The last, uh, twice in the last few years, this Northwest Passage was open for the first time in, in human history, as far as we know. Um, the area on Greenland that has melting during the summer, we began to measure from satellites again in the late 1970s. And that fluctuates with the weather, but again, that's increasing. And that uh, meltwater will go to a low spot on the ice sheet, burrow a hole through the ice sheet, go to the base of the ice sheet where it lubricates the ice sheet and speeds up the discharge of giant icebergs to the ocean. Still, we did not know for sure whether that process was causing the ice sheets to get bigger or smaller because the warming atmosphere also holds more water vapor, so the snowfall in the winter increases. Common sense would tell you that as the planet gets warmer, the ice sheets are probably going to get smaller. Now we have these measurements from the gravity satellite, which measures the gravitational field with a sufficient accuracy that you can measure changes in the mass of the ice sheets. And during the Winter, the ice sheet gets heavier, and during the melting season, it loses mass. Overall, it's losing mass, and the Antarctic ice sheet is also losing mass. This is a couple of hundred cubic kilometers per year of mass loss, which is still not great. The, the um, sea level is going up about three centimeters per decade, which 
is a little more than a foot in a century. But that rate has increased. It's doubled over the last few decades. And the scary thing is that the, the rate of ice loss seems to be um, increasing in the last few years. Um, that's the, the danger that we will push this uh, system beyond a tipping point and it will really start to lose mass rapidly. Another effect of global warming is on the overturning circulation. As the, the rising motion in the tropics and the subsidence in the subtropics, which causes the subtropics to be dry, that circulation cell is expected to expand as the planet gets warmer. And we observe empirically that averaged over all longitude, it has expanded by about four degrees of latitude, which is affecting the southern United States, the Mediterranean region, and Australia in the southern hemisphere. And it's one of the reasons why Lake Mead and Lake Powell are only half, half full. And it's one of the reasons that the fires have uh, become more frequent and cover larger area and, and more intense. They burn hotter, which is is not good for the forest because it's harder to recover if they burn the seeds as well as uh, the trees. The glaciers all around the world, in the Rockies, the Andes, the Himalayas, the Alps, glaciers are receding. And that uh, also will be a problem because once they are gone, those rivers which derive their water during the dry season uh, from um, melting glaciers will have much less water in them. And that includes some of the major rivers of the world, which um, people depend on for fresh water. Coral reefs are under stress, both because of the warming surface water, which causes the corals to bleach and expel uh, symbiotic algae, and, um, and the acidification of the ocean. As CO2 in the atmosphere increases and goes into the ocean, it makes the ocean more acid. And that is not good for uh, carbonate, those animals that have a carbonate skeleton or carbonate shells. As the ocean becomes too acid, it will dissolve the carbonates. So um, for a number of reasons, we estimate that we should really try to keep CO2 less than 350 parts per million if we want to keep a planet that looks like the one that has existed the last 10,000 years. And I think the most precise quantitative evaluation is from the planet's energy balance. If we know that the planet is out of balance by at least half a watt per meter squared, and we can say very precisely if we keep everything else fixed, how much would we have to decrease CO2 to increase heat radiation to space by half a watt? It would be between 35 and 40 ppm of CO2. And since we're now at 389 ppm, that means back to 350 parts per million. That would restore the planet's energy balance. It would to first approximation, it would remove the tendency for any further melting of the Arctic sea ice, for example. Uh, but, of course, we're not uh, decreasing CO2 now. We're continuing to increase it at 2 ppm per year. Um, but, if, as I say, if we want to keep a planet that looks like the one we know, we had better decrease CO2. There's an interesting bug behind this screen, isn't there? <laughs> Maybe it's in my computer. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the implication is that we cannot burn all the fossil fuels. We, the fossil fuels that we've burned already are the purple part of these bars. There's uncertainty as to how much undiscovered reserves there are for the oil, gas, and coal. And, and this is probably, IPCC number is probably too large. But, there, but there's more than enough to send us back to the ice-free state. So the, if we, we simply can't burn all of the coal, and we cannot burn these unconventional fossil fuels, the tar sands and the tar shales. If we would phase out coal emissions over the next 20 years, 
and if we would leave these in the ground. Then, because of the finite supply of oil and gas, CO2 in the atmosphere would peak at something between 400 and 425 ppm, depending upon whose estimate is more accurate. Um, and depending upon whether we go after the last drops of uh, oil. Uh, but, and still, we, CO2 would not decrease below 350 ppm for centuries, unless we do something else. If we, if we reforest marginal lands, there are some things we could do in order to, to get CO2 to go back below 350 ppm more accurately. But the main problem is you've got to stop burning coal. Um, Quick coal phase out is essential, and we can't burn the unconventional fossil fuels. But what's actually happening? Well, the United States uh, just signed an agreement with Canada for a pipeline to carry the tar sands oil to Texas oil refineries. And there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, carbon in the tar sands. And new coal-fired power plants are being built all around the world. So there's a huge gap between the rhetoric and uh, the reality. Policies, um, even those that are attempted, are very small perturbations to business as usual. And uh, I, what I find is that even in the greenest countries, like Norway and Sweden, uh, the, the uh, fossil fuel industry has a tremendous sway on governments. Um, so, you know, we, there was a Kyoto Protocol which went into effect a decade ago. Up until the Kyoto Protocol, emissions were increasing one and a half percent per year. Since then, even with this economic uh, last two years, some decreases in emissions, the rate of growth has been two and a half percent per year. So, Here's the, the uh, fundamental point. As long as fossil fuels are the cheapest energy, then we're going to keep burning them. <clears throat> and that's as certain as the law of gravity. Um, the reason that they're cheapest is partly because they're subsidized, but mainly because they don't have to pay for their costs to society. The damage just to human health, there's a million people a year die from air and water pollution, most of it due to fossil fuel. Uh, but the cost for people who don't die is, is huge. The impact on um, human health, the, all those costs are borne by the public. Fossil fuel companies don't have to pay for that. And they don't have to pay for the damage that it will do to future gener to the environment and to uh, the future of young people uh, due to climate change. So, uh, you know, what, unle unless, unless the price of fossil fuels is increased, we can't solve the problem. You can't pretend, C Congress was trying to pretend last year, they were trying to say well, we could have a cap in, divid, cap in uh, trade, and they're pretending that this would not have any effect, any significant effect on fuel prices. Well, if it doesn't have an effect on fuel prices, it's not going to solve the problem. Uh, so I say what you should do is apply a fee to oil, gas, and coal at the first sale, at the domestic mine or at the port of entry. And that fee should rise over time. In order for it to rise to a high enough level, the money should be given to the public, 100%, so that the public has the wherewithal to make the changes in their lifestyle to move to low carbon energy sources, a more energy efficiency. Um, this, would allow, this would allow the market to choose the technology winners. In, in contrast, cap and trade, which is designed by big banks like Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, it's uh, it's 
there's no, they, they add no value to the problem. What we need is a rising price on, on carbon emissions. There's no reason to introduce the banks into the problem at all. They would make huge amounts of money, but it, who would pay it? It would all come from the public through increased energy prices. Um, so, in contrast, a, a fee and green check in which, you know, if by the time the, the fee increased to $115 a ton, that is equivalent to $1 a gallon of gasoline. That, given the amount of fossil fuels that we've burned in the last few years, that amounts to uh, $670 billion a year, which you divide it up among the legal residents, it's about three. Three thousand uh, dollars a year per person, and so, and that that would um, that green check would stimulate the economy, and it would lead it would stimulate innovations that are needed in order for us to move on to the energy systems beyond fossil fuels, which we're going to have to do anyway. Fossil fuels are a finite resource, so why not leave uh, the dirtiest ones? especially the coal and, and unconventional fossil fuels in the ground. And that's the only internationally viable approach. There's no way that China or India will ever accept a cap, but they have every reason to accept, to impose an internal carbon price because China will suffer the most from climate change. They have uh, 350 million people living near sea level. They have very dirty air, which they would like to clean up. They, um, um, and they are, I forgot what I'm, <laughs> let me think. Um, well, okay. Um, yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, intergenerational issue, injustice of uh, climate change. This, uh, now my son has two children. So now I have four grandchildren. We have four grandchildren. My wife is here someplace. We'll see her. But this is, this photo uh, I took two and a half days after our most recent grandchild was born. Um, and her older brother was very happy to have um, a younger sister. And Jake is um, a gentle giant. He is in the top 1% for his age, for in his size, and the tables say he will be about two meters high when he grows up. But he, and he thinks that he can protect his baby sister. Uh, unfortunately, we are, what we are doing, if we continue business as usual, for even another decade or two, we will leave a situation which is out of their control. Um, and that is not consistent with any, uh, with any culture, really. Um, and, and, and any and parents have always been willing to sacrifice for their children. They certainly would not intentionally leave their children with a mess that cannot be fixed. Uh, the problem is that governments uh, feel that they can um, set emissions at whatever level they choose, and they choose to set them at basically business as usual. Um, now, I, I have uh, two reasons for some optimism. I just came back from China uh, where they are now number one in pr production of solar cells, uh, wind energy, and nuclear power. They're building 24 nuclear power plants. They're doing these things very rapidly, and that's one of the reasons why I say that they would and I, I wrote an op-ed when I was over there, which was published in a major newspaper, arguing that, arguing that first of all, we need Chinese leadership because the Western governments are not providing it. But um, that it makes, would make sense for them to impose an internal carbon uh, price. 
uh, which would then set the, be a framework for international approach. You know, I'd been saying, over the last two years, I've been saying, well, what's really required is there has to be an agreement between China and the United States. And if we would have an, an agreement, both countries would have a carbon price, which gradually increases over time. Then, of course, Europe and Japan would go along with this. And any countries that did not have a carbon price, you would put a duty on goods from those countries, goods that are um, commonly made with fossil fuels. And, and that would <laughs> encourage uh, those countries to have their own carbon price because that would they would rather collect the money themselves rather than have it collected at our border. Um, but now what I've realized, you're never going to get the agreement with not because China won't agree, but because you can't get the United States to agree. It'd have to go through Congress. It won't happen. But what I realized is it doesn't require the United States. If, if Europe would agree with China to have a rising carbon fee and impose duties on products from the United States, and, which the World Trade Organization allows such duties, as long as they're fair, they're in consistent with the internal carbon price, then, um, then the United States might wake up and realize it's going to be a third-rate nation if it doesn't um, start to move away from fossil fuels. Then there's also the legal approach. You know, our, the first, which we're going to, which, uh, well, let me say the first line of the Declaration of Independence is something like, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. And that leads in the Constitution to the concept of equal protection of the laws. And that was the basis by which the courts helped minorities gain civil rights. They could tell the government, you've got to desegregate schools, give us your plan and come back to us next year and show us what you've done. They could do the same with, um, I don't think the, the administration, the, the uh, government should be free to set emissions at whatever level it chooses. I think the courts could say you need to set emissions at a level which will lead to uh, stabilization of climate. Um, so that's, uh, I think, worth pursuing in the United States and other countries which are recalcitrant. Um, that's called, uh, the, the, the legal scholars talk about atmospheric trust litigation. Um, and there are plans to, um, to pursue this. Um, and you can read about these things on my website at Columbia University. Thanks. So I think this is the right amount of time, right, for begin questions and answers. Opportunity for questions. Could you please wait till you get the microphone? Questions. So here, here you pro you propose a specific uh, a specific mechanism, charging for carbon and so on. What about other proposals such as geoengineering and putting aerosols in uh, the upper atmosphere, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Well, of course, what we're doing <laughs> with CO2 is geoengineering. Um, and uh, there are soft geoengineering things that might make sense, like trying to draw CO2 back out of the atmosphere. If we burned biofuels at power plants and captured the CO2 and sequestered that, then it would draw down the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And reforesting of um, marginal lands, which are not good for agriculture, it has the potential to store a lot of uh, carbon dioxide, as much as maybe 50 ppm. But in the same way, but uh, th there's a limit on that. The best you could do is sort of reforest what we've deforested. 
Um, I, the ideas of putting particles into the atmosphere and reflecting away sunlight, well, that, I, I, yeah, you could cool the planet that way, but of course you're not going to be reducing the CO2 or solving the ocean acidification problem. And uh, I think uh, with the difficulty we're having getting governments to face uh, reality, we may well push the system to a point where we begin to see ice sheets beginning to collapse. And then you've got to do something rapidly. And you, and you can't tie a rope around an ice sheet which is uh, two kilometers thick. So it is interesting that uh, the, during, after the Pinatubo volcano in 1991, that was followed the next summer <clears throat> by the least melting on the Greenland ice sheet of any year in this 30-some uh, year record. So, of course, it does. So, but um, I don't, that, that uh, covering up one pollutant with another one is not, uh, not a very sensible thing to do. It makes much more sense, I mean, right now, energy efficiency alone can reduce emissions a lot if we and at a no cost but we just don't we don't push those things and it's not going to happen without a price it's not energy is cheap enough that people just waste it you've got to make it more expensive um, that's uh, that's as I say it's as uh, it's as sure as the law of gravity. As long as, as these fossil fuels are so dirt cheap, we'll just keep burning them. Where do you think um, population growth fits into your thoughts on this whole subject? Yeah, that's a good question. That's, that is an important uh, point. Um, I, I'm, <clears throat> I think there's reason for some optimism about uh, population. It can't continue to go up. Uh, any things that we gain by means of improved efficiency or renewable energies or uh, carbon-free energies is lost if the population just keeps going up. But China, for example, I, I, I hadn't realized, you may have known this already, but I just learned last week when we were there that the, they, of course, have been controlling population the last couple of decades with a one-child policy. Well, it now, now they're allowing the children born in that policy, when they marry, they're allowed to have two children. Uh, and that, of course, is going, their population, even with allowing two children for these, uh, these uh, young people, will cause their population to begin to decline. They're, um, they're actually, they're working so hard now to try to get rich before they get old because their population is aging uh, rapidly. But also in developed countries all around the world, the, the fertility rate is below the replenish, replenishment level. It's, in, it's only in some of the developing countries, especially Africa, where the population is still shooting up. Um, and in the United States, it keeps increasing because of immigration. Uh, if, um, so population is an important aspect of the problem. Um, and, uh, but I think it's a, a solvable one, and it, um, but it's, it's one of the facets of the problem. Hi. Um, in your oh, first oh, hold on one sec. So let me just say one more thing about the population. Um, because I think the key thing is what has been learned is that women's education is an important part of this. It, having many children is becoming unpopular with women in most countries, and as this, as the communication has improved, it that that's had an effect, even in countries which uh, uh, are not as 
don't have as, as a good education as you'd like. So I, I, and I think that if we had a, a scheme where we had a carbon price and we're putting a, a border duty on those countries that don't have a carbon price, then what are you going to do with the money that you collect at the border duties? I, th I say that should go to developing countries and you should, you should not just give it uniformly, you should give it to those countries that will have policies that are needed to have a sustainable planet. So you encourage things like uh, reducing, preventing this rapid population growth in those developing countries. So we'll have a lot of, we'll have, could have leverage on trying to um, deal with the population problem. Okay, could you go ahead with the other question? Sorry. You mentioned in your first slide about the knowledge gap between the scientists and the public. And I was wondering about your thoughts of the role of science, scientists in defending climate science to the public, but also going a step further in what you have done in taking a moral stance and even, you know, affirmative action and things like that. Um, you know, uh, well, I had thought that it was a communication problem. That was why I started to speak out a, f a few years ago when I, I thought there was this gap and they just didn't understand. But what I find is that, I, you know, most people in the government, are, uh, they know that there's a problem. Um, and we're, we've actually lost ground in terms of, edu of informing the public in the last year or two. And in good part, it's because the people who want to continue business as usual have done a masterful job of um, uh, of making the public think we, you know, scientists are making this stuff up because they want to get more research funding. Or, <laughs> you know, it, and it's, it's interesting to contrast the situation here with the situation in China. They don't, that government doesn't, uh, you know, they, they want advice and they, and they, they seek um, the, the best advice they can get. And, uh, that, uh, unfortunately, um, is not the case here. And I, so I think, yeah, we have to try to speak up here, but it doesn't seem to be very effective so far. And that's why I'm talking about going to court, because, you know, the judges can, we, we can make the story plain enough and certain enough that an, an intelligent judge will know that we know what we're talking about. Um, but making the public understand that when you've got news programs where you know half the people like to hear conservative things, so they turn on these programs which just say what they want to hear, and um, they claim that that uh, we're making this stuff up. It, that the public uh, debate um, seems to be a very hard place to move the discussion. In, leading to the actions that are needed. So um, I have um, more hope that either through the actions of other countries like China making progress that shows it's going to leave uh, the U.S. behind if we don't um, begin to also have uh, clean energies, then um, that's one route and also going to court is another route. But and we have to try to use the democratic process. So that's why I have my grandchildren writing letters to the president and try to use the democratic process. But so far it hasn't been very effective and, we're, and I think we're gonna have a hard time generating the million letters that we want to get. Um, to that very point, um, I keep wondering why there can't be a blog of some sorts where all the information comes from now um, with the effectiveness of something like um, factcheck.org. If somebody could create a fabulous scientific accuracy um, blog, I don't know who would have the money or the time or the, um, or even the even handedness to do this. But I'm, I know Rush Holt is here and it would be really nice, or he was, it would be really nice if somebody with his authority and, and perhaps some volunteer um, 
hordes of people working with him could make a go-to site for the truth in the science about global warming or climate change, change whatever you want to call it. Of course, the, the science is complicated, but we've got the most authoritative scientific body in the world, the National Academy of Sciences. If the president would ask the academy for a report and how urgent is this? You know, he, he would get a very clear answer. And, and of course, we had hoped that when President Obama was elected that he would give this some priority. And if he had wanted to, then he would, he would have to, he could use the academy to give him some backing. And then he would have to talk to the public and say, we need to solve our energy, um, our fossil fuel addiction. There will be many benefits of doing this. Climate uh, stabilization is one of them, but there are others uh, that are of enormous value to the public. But, um, you know, that didn't happen. Um, and um, there's just too much, you know, they, they say, well, there's so many states in the U.S. are coal states. And, and even though the number of miners is more than an order of magnitude smaller than it was decades ago, they, they, they act as though this is a, a big reason for continuing to mine coal, even though the jobs that would be associated with other energies are better jobs and probably more of them. So it, it should have been, yeah, we're waiting for a, a leader who will um, stand up and tell the truth and, and get the public behind it. Um, but um, it's not easy. Money talks. That, our, our democracy was supposed to be based on one person, one vote. But it's now one dollar. And that's, that's uh, a basic problem. Um, you know, I found the same thing in, in the case of Norway. I, the prime minister actually responded, or he got his environment minister to respond to me about the tar sands. And um, his answer was, the, the thing is the Norwegian government owns stat oil, 60, two thirds of stat oil. And they're the ones developing tar sands. And then his answer was, well, it's not the government's business to interfere with a commercial decision. Well, you know, what are governments good for if they don't protect the public? Uh, they're, they're, uh, in, in, in effect, what he is saying is, you know, that, well, these fossil fuels are very good for Norway. They're getting a lot of money. And they're very wealthy because of the, their uh, fossil fuels. And they don't want as the North Sea oil declines, they're looking for another source. I'm not sure if this has a simple answer, but I've always wondered, uh, as you said, money talks. Why is there more money on the side of continuing business as usual? You can, you've outlined, and one can certainly imagine, you know, insurance companies and all sorts of other moneyed interests that would want business as usual not to continue. Yeah, there, there is money on both sides. Uh, <clears throat> but in this case, it seems that uh, a stalemate is all that's needed in order to prevent anything from happening. You see, that, um, it, the public has presented this picture. The media will always put up a contrarian. So you always get these two sides to the story, even though, you know, the scientific side, you'll have 98% of the relevant scientists, those who know what they're talking about and have training in the right areas on one side, but what you see in the media is more balanced, fair and balanced. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have one last question. Um, okay. uh, I, I wonder if you, if you could um, talk a little bit about drought um, in a warmer world. Um, it's easy to, to see how uh, in a warmer world the sea is going to be much higher. Uh, but I'm confused uh, from what I've read about um, 
what's likely to happen uh, if, you know, worst comes to worst and we can't um, keep carbon down uh, and, and it, things get, get warmer. Um, and I, I'm thinking, that I'm curious about whether the paleoclimate uh, data shed any light on that. Uh, I've seen studies where they've found apparently higher levels of dust during glacial times, which would seem to argue that it was drier then, and uh, it would seem intuitively likely that with a warmer world you'd have more moisture, and I realize more would <coughs> evaporate, and maybe you could just shed some light on, on, on that uh, issue about drought. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, it, it's going to depend on where you are, but on overall, what we can say with confidence is what uh, you were already alluding to. As the atmosphere gets warmer, it holds more water vapor. And so you get, on average, more rainfall. But it comes in the more extreme events. So what happens is that the ex both extremes of the hydrologic cycle get exacerbated as the planet gets warmer. And we already can see the um, increased um, frequency of 100-year floods, for example. Um, the, and that, uh, the tail of the distribution, as you move a distribution of rainfall events toward higher ones, the, the tail is very sensitive. So we're already at a point in many places where we see hundred-year floods occurring two or three times the frequency that they, you, you would expect. But when it is, at times and places when it's dry, because the temperature is higher, you get more uh, hotter temperatures like we've seen in Australia and Greece and Moscow last summer. So you get more extreme uh, dryness than you're accustomed to in the prior climate. And so that, you can make that, those general statements that the extremes are going to increase. But still, it does depend on the particular location you're at. So as I mentioned, the, the overturning circulation on the average, averaged overall longitudes, is going to expand. And that is uh, probably one of the reasons why the southern United States has had more extreme uh, heat and uh, fires. And, uh, but precipitation is notoriously uh, noisy. So don't, you have to get a lot of statistics before you can really check these things out. But, but, um, but those tendencies are what you should look for. Let me, let me remind you now that there, you're welcome to continue the discussion at the reception in Ford Hall. And I'll ask you to thank James Hansen again for his very provocative, thought-provoking talk. Thank you.